I attended Catholic school from kindergarten until eighth grade. I was an altar boy for several years. I hit rock bottom when my first grade teacher called a conference with my parents to encourage me to get into more trouble. In my entire academic career, I've had one detention, and it was for telling on my middle school classmates who were smoking cigarettes. So it might seem surprising to you that this innocent Catholic schoolboy is speaking to you today about the value of lying. It's a tough case to make. Uh, studies show that people regard honesty to be the most important virtue. Honesty builds trust, while dishonesty destroys careers and relationships. We have, if I may borrow my son's language, pantloads of examples. <laughs> Lying didn't help Nixon, Clinton, Enron, or the housing market. Lies are dangerous, and we protect ourselves by teaching children about the destruction lies cause. Most of us probably have honesty is the best policy soldered in our minds. Alas, despite all these warnings, we lie frequently. Most of us, one to five times a day. <laughs> Lying starts when we're toddlers and then peaks when we're teenagers. I doubt that comes as a shock to any of you. <laughs> From there, the frequency drops, but still 44% of those aged 60 to 77 lie daily. Overall, we lie more than we brush our teeth. And this holds true across cultures, something we know because of the research of Dr. Timothy Levine. Now, Levine's research grouped lies into four broad categories. Lies to protect ourselves, lies to promote ourselves, lies to impact others, and lies for which the motives are unclear. The vast majority of these lies lead to devastatingly destructive outcomes. To be more precise, about 93% of them do. The remaining 7%, though, are remarkable and do practically the opposite. Now, white lies are a portion of the lies that benefit others, but they're uninteresting weenie lies. We all know you should tell your friend that the dress doesn't make her look fat, even though it does. Um, or that that horrendous sweater that your grandma got you is really just your favorite, sorry Gran, or that your child's drawing, even though you can't quite tell if it's an alligator or a bear, is artistic genius. We generally accept this kind of lying and these lies because they're socially polite. But I want to focus on high-stakes lies that benefit others. So cutting-edge research allows us to understand the complex and complicated nature of a special type of lie, a lie so extraordinary that it builds trust, builds relationships, and can benefit society even better than honesty sometimes. So allow me to introduce the pro-social lie. The exact definition of a pro-social lie is evolving as the research continues. So for today, I'm gonna to be defining it as a lie that has the goal of um, deceiving the target of the lie, but also has the goal of benefiting the target of the lie. So what does a pro-social lie look like? Imagine you're a parent, and you dislike your child's spouse. You might opt to pretend that you like their spouse so that you can spare your child the suffering and distress that occurs when parents-in-laws and spouses don't get along. That's pro-social lying. Compassion is the unique quality that gives a pro-social lie its power. Pro-social lying is compassionate because it shares the goal of relieving the suffering and distress of someone else. Studies show that compassionate people pro-socially lie more than less compassionate people. To put this another way, compassionate people lie because they care. And the most interesting part is this doesn't even seem to harm trust. Studies show that benevolence 
in the form of pro-social lying does more to foster honesty than, or more to foster trust, excuse me, than honesty or selflessness. The key is intention. When we lie to benefit someone else, that builds trust. Now, the broader societal implications of pro-social lying are promising. But it's tricky to study pro-social lying in communities. We can't make people 100% honest, and we can't inject dishonest people into an existing community. Besides being impossible, nobody in their right mind is going to approve of that study. But thanks to a mashup of physics and computer modeling, we're able to recreate these settings virtually. Think The Sims, but with more liars and pant loads of math. So a recent team of researchers used computer modeling to create a completely honest society, a completely dishonest society, and one with pro-social liars. Not surprisingly, the completely dishonest society sucked. <laughs> However, the society with pro-social liars had groups that were more diverse, interconnected, and cohesive than the completely honest group. Another way to view this is that the completely honest people made fewer connections to individuals outside of their community's niche. If the computers are right, we need pro-social liars to serve as social connectors who build healthier communities. So given the benefits of pro-social lying, we need to rethink how we teach lying. Our current standard of teaching about lying comes from an honesty-focused vantage. The top three stories we're told about lying are Pinocchio, The Boy Who Cried Wolf, and George Washington and the Cherry Tree. The first two stories teach us that bad things happen when we lie. We either grow monstrous noses or we're eaten. <laughs> the Cherry Tree story at least does a better job by rewarding honesty but still, none of these stories are doing anything to showcase the value of lying. We're missing an opportunity to teach about lying that can benefit individuals and society. Children learn about lying through happenstance and only if they discover the lie. For example, spoiler alert, your parents may have told you about a magical fairy who exchanges teeth for money in the night. Your parents told you this story to relieve you of the suffering and distress that occurred while your teeth were falling out as children. Another example might be a teacher who opts to boost up a student's grade because they know that that child is struggling with something at home. Or you might have a coach that exaggerates their player's ability so that they can give them confidence before they face a foe that is clearly superior. All of this is happening in the background. Nobody is holding our hand and walking us through how and when we should be pro-socially lying. I'll admit it, teaching children to lie just has a bad ring to it. But it's exactly what we need to be doing. So by now we know that pro-social lies build trust and benefit individuals and society. However, misused pro-social lies can be damaging. When we lie, even pro-socially, we are taking away someone's freedom, the freedom to know objective reality. And so we need to make a consideration that honors the gravity of the decision to lie. Benevolence is great, but when we mistakenly assume that we know best for someone else, that can come across as judgment, arrogance, or condescension. And so we need to take into account the benefit to the individual beyond our egotistical drives. I had to make this choice. My father was dying of cancer, and I flew back to Chicago because I knew he did not have long to live. When I saw him, the invincible hero that was my father was replaced by a broken shell of a human body. His first words to me were, it doesn't look great, Mark. The doctors say I have a 1% to 2% chance of living. I decided to tell him that he could make it, 
and that doctors have to be pessimistic. I spoke confidently about his recovery, even though I knew it was impossible. It didn't feel great to lie to my father, and I lied to relieve him of the suffering, and that didn't feel great to lie, but that didn't matter. He mattered, and I lied because I cared about him. I don't regret lying, and I'll never know if he believed the lie, but I'd like to think that he did, and if he did, I'd like to think that it helped him. And that is why pro-social lying is so important. Used properly, it is the moral, ethical, and compassionate thing to do. Sometimes that means we have to short-circuit our programming and change the way we think and be deceptive. And that is why it is so important that we continue to learn about pro-social lying so that we can confidently use it appropriately. Like most things, lying is multifaceted, and so we need to transform the way that we teach and think about this concept. Used properly, pro-social lying can relieve an immense amount of suffering and distress that is inevitable in our lives. And so I think we ought to give lying a shot. And that is my idea worth sharing. Thank you.